You can take away cricket. You can skip the last night of the proms. You can even lose an empire. But if you lose Shakespeare, as far as I'm concerned, there's no England anymore. It was here between the pit and the galleries that an idea of England was born. Here, said they, is the terror of the French. One that's lasted through wars and revolutions, migrations and immigrations. One that is still with us. This royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. But what Shakespeare gives us is never just fantasy Ireland, a dream of Albion. Oh, he can turn on the sceptered Isle mood music, all right. No one better. But that's not why Shakespeare sings to me. It's because in his histories, especially in the great masterpieces of Henry IV, part one and two, he gives us England unedited, the complete thing, the cream and the scum. The flea bag hostelries on the London Road, the chilly cathedrals where sour bishops crack their knuckles and plot. He gives us the clapped out actors and the greedy squires. He gives us the real thing, and that's what we want, don't we? The dirt and the devilry. Why then let grievous, ghastly, gaping wounds untwine the sisters three? Above all, Shakespeare gives us the voices of England, cascades of tumbling prattle, ripe curses, symphonies of gossip. By this wine, I'll thrust my knife in your mouldy chaps and you play the saucy cuttle with me. And this valour comes of Shellis. The miracle is that audiences could see England on the stage almost before it existed in reality. Over and over again, the word itself came booming over the boards. Nought shall make us rue if England to itself do rest but true. It was Shakespeare who gave us a sense of who we really are. How did he do it?